Camp, the weekly podcast where we discuss all things related to creating, living, and making projects. I'm your host, Grant Alexander, and joining me as always is Adam Mackey and Jesse Ratfink. If you listened to the last episode where we talked about the definition of handmade, we challenged a maker to come on and discuss the things he makes. You might know this maker from his amazing entries that were winners of the mallet challenge, or more likely because he puts boobs on everything. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Nick, from a virtual design build. Thanks for having me on, guys. Excited to be here. Yeah. Why don't you tell everyone uh, the, the elevator pitch of uh, who you are and what you do, other than put boobs on everything? So I'm uh, Nick Birchtold. The Instagram is Birchtold Design Build. I do uh, architecture models for a living, and I build a bunch of different wooden stuff for fun and to sell now. Um, but I got a pretty big focus on digital fabrication, um, more specifically CNC and rotary CNC. Yeah. And uh, if you did listen to the last episode where we actually wanted to talk to you mainly because we wanted to understand how you feel your work fits into the definition of handmade, because obviously a lot of what you do, it takes a lot of skill. And the, and I don't want to say that anything that you're doing isn't skillful. What I want to say is, is it handmade? And they, because a lot of people would, would want to argue that it is handmade. And uh, yeah, let's start off there. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think that what you do with the CNC especially is that handmade? So for me, I've always called it kind of handmade. Um, nothing gets on the CNC machine without handwork and nothing comes off the CNC machine without handwork. And then to go kind of further, it's with my stuff, I, I design it all on the computer work through sketches and then a computer 3d models and then work through multiple iterations of those. And then I do all of that 3d modeling with my hands as well. Right. But I kind of see CNC machines as another tool. I know Jesse said that on the last episode. So that's always been my, I put my foot down with that. Like it is, it's in the wood shop. It's another tool. Um, they're even sold at Rockler and Woodcraft now. So I don't think anyone can argue that CNC isn't woodworking anymore, but people still do. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that's a whole another uh, a whole another episode is CNC woodworking, and I don't think we need to have it because I think I think we're all on the same page that I think it it's is definitely woodworking. Yes. Yeah, uh, but so that's an interesting. I definitely thought you were going to take the other aspect to say it's not handmade. So I'm glad that we had you on because uh, it would have been a really short episode otherwise. Uh, but so uh, I agree, it's a tool. And I think uh, James from Fix the Fingers responded to our uh, YouTube video with like uh, a dissertation. A novel. Uh, a novel, yeah. <laughs> uh, if anyone wants to go check it out, you can check it out on the YouTube. But it was. If you're going to wait to read it. <laughs> where he was talking about uh, the thing that, that separates handmade from machine made uh, has to do with the amount of dexterity and like using your hands to move the material and and it's a marketing term is what he was saying and mm. from a marketing perspective handmade means you know i moved this material and so a sewing machine as a good example is you you clearly have to put this the material through a sewing machine. Yes, it's a machine. Yes, it's way faster, completely different. I don't even, looking at how a sewing machine works, I don't think I could make a stitch the way a sewing machine makes a stitch. But is it, is CNC handmade? Like, oh, it's, it gets hard. If it's moving the material, what if you move the tool through the material? Because wouldn't right. a CNC or, or the, yeah. just be, so a CNC would be a computer moving the, machine through the material right yes but your, your hands aren't directing the machine i think is the difference yes keyword there was machine uh, was computer yeah. moving the machine through the material okay but then if i to take it a little bit like what about a panto router if anyone watches matthias wandel they see the panto router it's the same you're you're like using a jig to make sure it's perfect What's the difference between that and using the computer to make sure it's perfect? This is going to be another episode where you need to be drinking every time I contradict yeah. myself. 
<laughs> well, so I really think it comes down to what Nick just mentioned. There is so much work that happens before you put that piece into the machine. So much work be it designing or just processing like whatever your material you're using so that it goes in the machine and you're going to get the result you want from it. There is so much that happens. Yeah. Before, after. Yeah. That's why I keep falling into most things made on a CNC are handmade. Nick? Yeah. That's, that's where I stand too. Um, I, I would, in my mind, I was kind of comparing it to a panther router too, and I understand that you're holding your hands are holding the panther router, but you've set up jigs and everything. I don't know how far back we need to go with this, but like a table saw is a robot. Um, you're feeding it through yeah. with your hand, but you're not using a hand pull saw to cut boards. It's for me, I don't know. The CNC is always just the next evolution in tools. It's it only does what you program it to do the same mm -hmm. as a table saw fence. It's only going to cut straight if you set up your fence straight and it's only going to cut three inches. If you set your fence to three inches, it's just another tool. So I, another thing I was, I was discussing with another commenter, Warren, uh, Warren Matten, I think uh, he, he was talking a lot about like his definition of handmade is, is a lot like yours. If you know, humans are involved, it's handmade. But then I think there's a difference slightly between handmade and man-made. Is a car like handmade if someone designed it, and then it, but it goes on a the machinery of a assembly line that's all run by robots? But someone had to program all those robots to do all those things using their hands. Is a car handmade? <laughs> no, because so. like not just one person could complete that entire process. Think about how many teams there are in a car factory. Think about how many sectors. They could, but that is what I would consider handmade. But when you're doing something oh, at that scale with multiple hands in the process, that's something different. So I would say man-made instead of handmade. So are you using handmade to say small batch production like versus high like, well, that's a good point. Because like, I mean, that's I where I think a, a lot of people talk there. about. Yeah. Right? But so that's where I go. Like, Nick, do you think if you gave me your CNC and your G code that I could produce something that you made? Um, to a, to a certain point, um, I, I think that it's comparable to like a, I could give you a dining table file and say, "Hey, make this." It's how much. There's a lot of, there is a lot of hand work that goes into them before and after. So like, I don't know. I mean to keep repeating myself, but. Yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> that, that sort of going on that aspect, like if you were to buy a plan of someone and make the, off the plan, it can still be handmade. Right. Oh, I think. So yeah. you can't really, okay. you can't really go by, by that. Also, I just want to quickly say, I hate the term man-made. Can we say custom-made? Because I think custom-made is more what we talk, what we mean. So, when I say, like, man-made, I'm not talking custom, because I think custom-made is more where down to handmade and custom-made are closer. When I think man-made, I mean, like, made by humans. Uh, right. Versus, like, found in nature. Mm -hmm. like, right? Because I would say, like, like um, Nick's mallets, I would say, are custom-made. Yeah. Because it's a custom piece. Even though, like, you, you could mass produce it and you could sell literally, like, the exact same mallet over and over and keep cutting the same piece, it's still custom designed by you. Yeah. So, um, I guess to touch on a point that you had made with your last podcast, too, is uh, human error on that. Yeah. yeah. So, like, things post processing before and after, like, there's human error with that, too. It's you got to cut it off, sure. you got to round parts, you got to say with a mallet head that I'm not cutting the whole piece on the CNC machine. I'm, I'm cutting the pieces I need the CNC to cut like anything with a, yeah. like a carved 3d texture. I'm going to do that on a CNC. And I get, my reasoning behind that is I don't have a lot of time. So the CNC can mm. do a lot of this work for me faster. I mean, I have the idea to do it, but the CNC allows me to, to crank a project out a week. Whereas if I was kind of hand carving it, it would take me much, much longer. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think that's what I said last week too, is that if you if you still have like if you actually have to assemble it and everything after, I would consider that handmade. But if you 
if you if the CNC like say you had the rotary on and it literally carved the entire mallet and you just peeled it off and that was it the finished project I wouldn't call that handmade because you've literally not touched it with your hands at all right but if you if you're cutting out like, pieces to assemble that's it that can be handmade like I see on on Reddit and Imgur all the time these like tool gifts of like a, a piece being fed into a CNC like lathe that like produces an entire tool from bar stock to a tool yeah. that gets cut off at the end and then the piece gets fed in through the back and up to a stop and then they start the whole process again. Hmm. Uh, but somebody still had to spend time on the computer designing that. So it's definitely like it can be custom, right? Like if you, but it can also be, I think the big thing is like, I, I think the big thing is it's a marketing thing and, and it's up to interpretation. Yeah. Now, I, I know you've done a little 3D printing, Nick. What What are your thoughts? Is that like, where does the line like 3D DIY Dave did a did a bunch of scans and PS still regretting the fact that I was there at Maker Camp and for some reason felt like I wasn't good enough to be scanned. So now I'm not in your Maker Mallet. But because he was like scanning all the big people whenever I saw him, I didn't see him like scanning just random people. I saw him scanning like Pat Lap and I was like, oh, he's here to scan like Pat and Jimmy and stuff. But apparently, no, everyone else just got in there, too. And I was like, God damn it. I'm an idiot for not just talking to him. And until it was too late, but uh, it it so he's three D scanned it, and I know he does a bunch of post processing on the scan because it doesn't come out, you know, good enough to just pop into a model immediately. But say we had the technology that I could just scan something, pop it into to Fusion three hundred and sixty or something, and and the model is perfect, and and slice it up. Is that handmade? And then my printer pop poops it out. I would say. Like you guys were saying the other day too, is just a three D print. If you're going to download a file and then three D print that object, I wouldn't call that man made. There's a custom aspect to it. You pick a color, you pick the size, you pick how it's printed, the orientation of how it's printed, and then any kind of post processing that you would do to the three D print after, I would call hand. You could put a handmade tag on that, but I would I would very much call it the custom made. Yeah, that's a very. I, I, I'm glad we've come up with this custom made. I think it like mm -hmm. mm. it custom made makes it so much easier to talk about stuff in a way <laughs> that is like not derogatory to like, I'm not like shitting on someone who does something like the stuff, the work you do is amazing and there's oh, no yeah, way I, I would ever shit on it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't even think, you know, when I said like, if, if you gave me the, the lathe and the wood and, and the G code, I couldn't do it. I know I couldn't. I know what you do is nothing I could do. <laughs> I wanted you to say that and then I would agree with you, but instead you were very nice about it. I went, well, maybe I don't know this guy well enough to, <laughs> to know whether or not he could do it. No, I, don't, I also wouldn't I don't like agree. to have you search history. <laughs> <laughs> do you know, it's, it's funny, something, I don't know how we've turned this into is it handmade 2.0, but. <laughs> I, I, something we didn't really think about, right, is what if you were to make like a hand carved model, cast it, and then pour a model like to make it to make a make models from that yeah. casting, uh, yeah, yeah, or whatever it is, like in the silicon mold, make a mold out of something handmade, or even like back in the day when they used to make stuff like stamped pieces of whatever that someone would hand carve that piece before it was like there was no CNCs back then. So someone right. would hand carve the metal blank and then the piece would get pressed on that. Would that be considered handmade? Because you've essentially handmade the blank and the machine. all the machine's doing is putting your weight on top. So for me, anytime it is molds and casting where you're having to mix the materials that you put in the molds or make the molds yourself, I would say even if you're reusing them over and over and over, that is still handmade. Mm. Because it's a very physical process. So essentially 40 years ago, a wheelbarrow that was pressed over a hand carved blank, every single wheelbarrow that was then pressed over that blank would be handmade. I'm starting to think yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would say no, but now I'm confused. Yeah. 
again. Yeah. <laughs> right, why don't we take it away from Is It Handmade? Because I think we had an entire episode and now we've had half of this one about it. And, and, and let's talk a little bit about, yeah, digital design. Yeah. I did have one one comment okay, go before ahead. we leave that. Um, a comment that I've gotten a couple of times is it would be better if it was handmade and no one's given me a real good explanation mm. as to why it would be. If it's the same quality, why would it be better if it was handmade? Ah. People get a sentimental value out of little chips and imperfections. And if I CNC mill something that's damn near like a, a perfect representation of what's on the computer, but... I'm sorry, but if someone could hand carve your mallets to the perfection the CNC does, they would have 100 years of experience. Yeah. There is no way that you could make those mallets hand carved without any imperfections. Well, I mean, that's the the comment that I kind of throw out to people too. Like if you want to hand carve it, hand carve it. We can put them yeah. side by side if you want <laughs> and let people judge which one's better and not better, but no one's been willing to do that. Mm. Not trying to be mean to anyone. I just you're gonna comment. Oh, I know what you mean. Like, oh, yeah. right. if this was handmade, it'd be a hundred times better than this CNC machine made one. It's like I don't know. At, I don't agree. Defense, but okay, I program the CNC to cut this, so it's an extension of my hands and my brain of how it's done. And I don't know. I've been doing CNC work for over ten years now, and I guess one last thing is. Man-made, I would kind of call, we were talking about man-made versus handmade versus custom-made. I would call man-made in the sense of like a Ford assembly line. That's just an automation. It's somebody handmade the first one, maybe somebody hand-programmed mm-hmm. the first one. And then after that, it's a repetition, but I would just call that automation kind of the same with okay. the wheelbarrow. It's an automated hand. There's still a handmade aspect to that, mm-hmm. but it's kind of automated now. So if I, I was like going to- I like that distinction, Yeah. If I was going to reproduce my mallets, I, in, I was just cranking the same one out over and over and over and over again. I would call that automated, automated right. made or automated design. Right. So it's like hand designed. And then, like, and I think this is where it comes down. And like you said, you hit the nail on the head where a lot of people have this sentimental feeling towards the, the term handmade or whatever they want. Like as soon as the CNC gets involved or even like plywood, as soon as someone says, Hey, would you like to make something out of plywood? And they go, never plywood, plywood's horrible. Never would I ever want plywood. I'm like, well, why not? Like, what do you, what do you, you want a box that's made out of not plywood for, like, for what reason? Oh, cause plywood's horrible. I'm like, at what? At being dimensionally stable? At being a perfect yeah. box forever? <laughs> right? Yeah. Like Okay, okay, Mr. I hate MDF. Oh, MDF is garbage because it's not wood <laughs> or it's just glue. It's like, <laughs> oh, I'd like to make something out yeah. of epoxy. Go ahead. Um it's just formaldehyde or something. I don't know. I I think MDF has its own thing, but uh that's where I go, is there is it an emotion I think you're I think you hit the head on the nail on the head, it's an emotional thing. And people see imperfections and think handmade. But when I see a lot of stuff I buy from factories in other countries, uh, it looks, I, I'm i guessing it's handmade because there, there's yeah. a lot of imperfections. <laughs> uh, so I wonder, like, does that, but people complain about that constantly. Right. I mean, you could technically model imperfections into your CNC cut. <laughs> you could also drop drop it on the ground after and kick it around. Or yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. I could break make a couple it more handmade than machine made, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I guess me and my background in architecture and the guys I work for is everything is we're on a constant like suit of perfection, like on the pursuit of perfection. It's how perfect can we get these things? And I don't know that comes across. I try to make that as part of my kind of design philosophy too. It's the CNC is a tool that can make it more perfect than I can make it by hand. I'm going to program the CNC to do it. Yeah. Well, this is where, so I was designing and, and milling out a part for the race car. And I was like, I need to make a circle and I, I know I can cut a circle. Right, I could set up a jig on my bandsaw. It's just aluminum. I can cut the circle. But I was like, 
if I use the CNC, it's going to be a perfect circle, right? But if I if I do it on the bandsaw, it'll be pretty close. So I did one on the bandsaw, and it ended up we had to do a bunch of filing because it 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 didn't meet the spec. It looked good, looked like a circle, but it when you're talking about uh, certain specifications, you got to meet, you know. Yeah. You got to do it, and the CNC is going to do it better every single time. It's going to beat my ability to get within a thou every single time. Yeah, I agree with that too. It's uh, more than one. Or I've had it said to me a bunch of times. There's more than one way to skin a cat too. It's I can CNC cut a circle. That would be the fastest and the easiest. And CNC always comes down to time too. It's how fast can I do the part? It would be faster to make if it's faster to make it by hand. I'll make it by hand. I do have right. a router circle jig that I use sometimes. If they're small circles, I laser cut little acrylic templates and flush them out those. And that's always called handmade, but it's the same exact process, but computer driven compared to hand driven. Right. Well, and like uh, this is where I go. Like my printer pops out a template, and then I follow a line, or even more, I you know, get a, like you're saying, you get a laser cutter to pop out a, a template that I use on my router. What, how is that handmade at all? If you don't consider the other CNC stuff handmade, like, Oh, I, I used, I used my router to follow us a, a CNC made template. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm currently in the middle of um, printing a 3d model to paint and I'm not going to call it handmade. <laughs> right, but then you can call it hand painted. Yeah, so, call and it this is painted. where yeah. this is the the parts that get crazy. It's like it's all about marketing. If you're not selling it, doesn't matter. Yeah. Probably not. You know, it but, actually something like you said before that I didn't really think about, and I know we keep trying to move away from this. Is it handmade? <laughs> but at what point? What point of it being in production does it stop being handmade? Like how right. how many would you have to put? Like how many would you have to? make for it to no longer to be handmade of the exact same thing. I don't know. See, I, I feel I, like, a, go on. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, like, I'm a big fan of limited run type artwork anyway. Mm. So a lot of that is considered handmade, but I don't, another tool that comes to mind was the repeater. So if I wanted to hand carve something by hand, I can send it to a buddy of mine in Grand Rapids and have him throw it on a repeater. And then that just follows with the little probe and mills right. out the same part as well. So that's not even computer driven. It's machine driven, but I wouldn't call that really handmade at that point either. I would call that automation. Right. Mm -hmm. Same with like a, a lathe duplicator, right? We just following along a thing and yeah, you get, you have to, but you have to physically do it. So like, yeah, I guess I was doing a tap, tap handles for a buddy who started a brewery and I made his first 25 and I was like, after that, I don't, I don't want to make any more. It's already starting to feel like automation at that point anyway. So I set him up with my guy with the repeater and we sent him a blank and he milled out hundreds of them. Oh, wow. But his price was way lower than my price too. So doing them one at a time with me, it's one machine and I do them one at a time. I would say that's closer to handmade than, mm -hmm. but it's still, I guess, leaning more towards custom made to me, but I don't argue, I guess I don't argue with anybody on, whether it's handmade or not, everyone has their own. Like with my stuff personally, it's everyone has their own opinion. Oh, it's handmade. Oh, it's machine made. It's I don't know. For me, I made it all, so it is what it is. Yeah. And I'm right. showing you what I want to show you. Well, like James said, it's, it's honestly a, a sale term, really. The whole handmade thing, and it, it's more of like if someone's like, "Oh, that's not handmade. Prove it's not." I don't need to prove it is. You need to prove it's not. So yeah. Wow. There's like Corey, Corey from Odyssey Stan or Odyssey CNC. Uh, he he had like someone comment like, "Well, you just chucked up that thing after you've you've done it," and it's like, "Well, why would I chuck it up in my lathe after I had like finished it somewhere else? Like, why would I do this? Yeah. Why would I fake this? You know, I don't know." He it's, did do uh, that with my mod. Uh, did he? Did yeah, you do that? I, I sent him a mat and he chucked it up on the machine as a joke. And I think oh. someone did comment of like, well, you didn't make that. Yeah. But I think yeah, he probably did. He, he had to do that after he'd gotten a couple of comments about some of the other, the gun stocks he'd made. And then nobody believed that they'd and done like, it on pretty, his. Uh, 
it's pretty obvious that your mallets could not be done on a lathe. There's like physically, there's no way that you could get that pattern out of a lathe. Sorry. So why don't we actually talk a little bit about what what it is that you like? How many axes do you have? Because once you get paid on three, I'm confused. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So I, I guess what I'm known for is working on the fourth axis. So you have your X, Y, and Z for your three axis, and then the fourth axis introduces an A and a B. So rotating front or back. Okay, that's you're going to need a little more information for me to understand that. Even though I've seen your work and I've seen it being done, I'm still confused. <laughs> so I guess uh, we can dive in. Corey's machines are a little bit different than my machine. So his is yeah. a three axis machine, but it is a three axis rotary machine. So he can move side to side, up and down and spin, but he can't move front to back. With my machine, it's a true fourth axis, and some people call that an indexer. It's, my definition for an indexer was always, if I want to cut something, say on a three axis, you can cut something flat. It's got to have flat. It's got to be on a table. You can only come at it from one direction. With the fourth axis, now I can rotate that part and kind of hit gotcha. anything. So if I wanted to mill an octagon, I would index that to the 45-degree angles or whatever that is right now. Um, a hexagon, 120 degree angle. So 120, 240, or 60, 120, 240, 180. Right. Mm. Um, but it so, writes, I guess, when programming something for four axis, like a finish pass, you're going to program that very similar to the way you would do it on a three axis. You can cut it across the grain where it rotates and cuts as it's rotating. Or like I like to do with a mallet, for example, is I do a parallel finish that runs with the grain because I feel mm. you don't see the tool marks as much. But I don't. I try to mill everything I do as fine as possible to avoid as much handwork and human error as possible to get kind of that perfect shape. But there is always some handwork. So with me, I, I mill with like a five thousandth step over, and then that makes it so I really only have to run it under like a nylon wheel to knock off the burrs and kind of shine it up. Huh. But I try to mill everything as fine as time allows. I was actually wondering about that. Do you have to sand every boob and nipple? No. God, no. <laughs> if I had to do that, I wouldn't do it at all. It's, yeah, I don't I, think, oh my God, that would take forever. <laughs> yeah. Well, then you would lose definition. So a big part of it for me too is getting the, I guess, in the term of the boobs is getting the shape of the boob. So it's not just like a bulbous form, but an actual mimicking a humic form. And then uh, an areola and a nipple, which are much more defined in my pieces than they would be in real life, but not always, I guess. <laughs> and to take it back to the whole digital design, where do you get the models from? So far, <laughs> I, I 3D model all, all of them so far from memory. Not from memory. Okay. From okay. memory. Who's, well, who, well, well, like, I, I guess I'm not. <laughs> so, so can I'm, we get uh, right down to whose memory are you referring to? <laughs> so just a, a compilation of, I guess I'm on the okay. kind of another pursuit of what's the ideal form or what would be the ideal form for the biggest variety of people. And, and I guess in my experience, it's always the ones that are talked about the most are the ones with kind of an up curve and then round, but not. Say that perky, I guess. <laughs> so, I mean, that's too like, far. think about all of the D&D &D, like artwork and all of the comic book artwork. Those are the tits. Yeah, it's definitely like the preferred. I'm so I can for this see conversation. <laughs> so I was talking with my buddy Alma from Pink, Pink Soul Studios too. And we were, I get comments every once in a while of like a little variation would be nice and a, a little bit more realistic and showing more to that and, I've dabbled with it, but they don't ever, I don't want to offend anybody. So on this idea of what everyone would consider the, uh, the perfect form, not necessarily the perfect form, but a perfect form, a perfect idea of a form of a breast. Right. But, but we have, I guess I have a scanner now, so I'm, I think I'm going to dabble in that a little bit at some point that'll happen, but it hasn't happened yet. Hello. I'm just going to have like an open call <laughs> session to just, and then make a mallet with that, or a mallet of ass. <laughs> I found that I can put boobs on just about anything. Yeah, fair. <laughs> fair enough. 
I did really like the uh, chest board. That was very nice. Chest board. So that, yeah, that all stemmed from I had cutting, like I would make cutting boards out of my really thin scrap pieces of wood that I would get from furniture projects and other wood projects and work projects. So I'd glue all those together and make blanks for cutting boards just to sell, to get them out of the shop without throwing them away. One idea, I was just like, I can mount. I got enough Z height clearance on my CNC that I can mount this vertically, and I can just mill boobs on the side of that. Well, like that's just for for me at that time. It was just for internet clicks. It's, <laughs> nobody's going to do that, and or people are going to click on that if they see it. Maybe that was my idea, and then people did, and then I had so many orders for cutting boards that I just did a like one run, and then I'm done. I don't want to do anymore. I'm <laughs> move on to the next thing. And, I don't know how many hundreds of people are like, oh, it's got to be a chessboard. Like, I don't know why your chessboard doesn't have these squares. So I'm like, I can do a chessboard. We'll call it the chessboard. So the cutting boards are breastboards and the chessboards are chessboards. <laughs> nice. <laughs> have uh, you dabbled in other anatomy? No, not interested. Not interested. <laughs> I, get, I get the request for those, but the, the crest for dicks and stuff, it's like, eh, I don't know. I, I can do it. But you're not going to want to pay what you're going to need to pay to get me to 3D model that or scan one. You've got a vase, a vase on your Instagram, Oside Orange Leopard Wood Purple Heart Maple CNC milled vase. It looks pretty close to a vagina vase. That was not the intention. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, I don't know. I get in the head in the computer Those too. Aren't <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it could be perceived as that, but that was not the. That was not the intention. I really like the the fake the faux like velvet, um, like I don't know what do you, what's tufting. that called? The, is it tufting? Yeah, I love I that look, tufting. like that carved mm -hmm. into wood. But you could do that without the fourth axis, right? Yeah, you don't need a fourth axis, right. like, yeah. No, yeah, yeah, that can, looks really cool. That's kind of one of those. But the same as like a boob. We will call that one piece of a tessellation, and then I can mirror that and duplicate it. And yeah. Once you have the one, so with the tufting, it was me modeling one square of the tuft pattern, and then I can parametrically 3D model that onto flat right. surfaces, curved surfaces, full 3D surfaces. I've got a plan to do a torus like that. So that'll be, oh. I think, a lot bigger of an argument of CNC versus, or <laughs> handmade versus um, CNC made, machine made. But that'll be milling a bunch of 3D segments and then gluing those segments and then surely yeah. finishing and sanding all those seams and stuff like that. Some hand carving as well. Hmm. Cool. So you were earlier talking about uh, like a 5,000th uh, step over as your final pass, right? Um, yeah. How long on a average boob handle would you say a final pass takes? So, so for boob the handle is like a, We'll call them 68, 68 inches. Is that? Yeah, the table saw handles are about six inches. Okay. The finished pass on that alone takes three hours. Wow. Whoa. So that is a gonna, time. So to do the, the lit, to do one of the vases, we're looking at like 12 hours to do like the full carved boobs all the way around one. Just on one pass, just on yeah. the finished pass. So that's not the, like, how many hours does it take to make? from start to finish on either, either with those, uh, both those projects. Table saw handle all in around four hours, but uh, me actually doing that, I guess the CNC is about three and a half hours and it takes me about a half hour to either both prep the blank and mount it to the machine and then unload it from the machine, trim it off the stock, finish the bottom, uh, needle right. file the burrs off and then wire wheel, nylon wheel the rest and then put a finish on it. And then install hardware. Cool. But I've got that kind of that set up for me. Those were like a production item. And those are getting further from what I would call handmade at that point. It's, I'm running the same file over and over and over and over. See, that's so that's the interesting part. It's like I think it's the whole thing is like at what point is I'm running the same file? Like if you made the file once, it's handmade. If you made it a hundred times, it's not anymore. Like that's so weird to me. That that there's this delineation, uh, that like there's yeah. a there's a number there where you go. I don't feel it's handmade anymore. I feel like the it. problem there is the repeatability of the per perfect piece. It's not how many you can make. It's the fact that you could mass produce it 
to make the same thing over and over to the same specification and perfection. Yeah. That, because that could, I think that could be done with any piece you make any time. Is it, I would get into, even with the little fence handles, It's I would call it kind of automation. I am cutting the blanks on the table saw to mount them to the machine, but I would even call that an automated thing. I'm setting the fence to one location, and I'm just, mm. there's no thought to it. There's no skill to it other than strength, a little bit of strength. As I push it through, I push it through, I push it through. All the tools are, I make sure all the tools are square. And it is what it is, but I would call that automation too. I, I think there's skill involved. And I think that's the problem is I think a lot of people say like handmade because they want to say, I, I am skilled, right? And I think there's a lot of skill that people don't realize about production eat production work. There's a lot of skill in production work. Like my recommendation mm-hmm. from last week, the production work that he does, the skill that he puts into it, uh, Jack, uh, he is Jack Forsberg from, from English Machines, Jack English. Uh, he like – the the stuff that he can put out of his shop is amazing, but it's because it's for it like it's production work, and he can just do it over and over and over again. And I think I think he would say all this stuff is handmade, but it's production work. Mm. It's a, like uh, it's a weird. Yeah, I don't know what to say to that. I I don't know. It's like a weird thing, and this is why this is part of the thing. I I enjoy these discussions because if there was a solid answer to it. The podcast would be two minutes. If we would say, <laughs> what is handmade? And then and then someone would Google it and would say, that is it. Thank you very much for listening this week. And we close the podcast <laughs> down, right? Uh, yeah. But I, I do think to, to – we'll get it away again. From, and we keep coming back to this, what is handmade? And I feel like we're going to become what is the what is handmade podcast. That's going to be our new tagline. But uh, – Designing stuff, you obviously have a lot of experience designing stuff through your day job and through all this other stuff that you've been doing. What are the different tools you use or programs you use to help you design this? Um, On the computer, for me, it's all Rhino. So I have Rhino, I think V7 now. Um, So I do all my design work in Rhino, and then all the guys at the architecture office do all of their design work in Rhino. Rhino was mm. the one that our professors told us to learn in college. So that's kind of what we all taught ourselves, but I guess it's more geared towards architects than it would be makers in that sense. It's got a higher price point, but it doesn't, I wouldn't say it does anything more than like a Fusion 360. Those would be very similar products, but to get into like multi access CNC cam work in Fusion 360, you have to pay for that now. So. You do right. like basic operations and Fusion 360 for free and then 3D modeling for free. But I guess mine is more architecture driven. So, and then tools, it's everything you can imagine. It's We need tools for jobs. I need to cut acrylic and fancy shapes. I have a laser cutter. I need to cut metal, wood, foam, plastic, and three-dimensional shapes. I have a CNC machine. I've got a water jet cutter, a vacuum form machine. And then all those go through kind of the same process too. So if I was going to make a vacuum form architecture model i've got a prep stock on a table saw which would be like a high heat resistant polyurethane resin and then i would mill that on a cnc and then i would modify that by drilling wheat poles and everything and modeling tears and steeps or uh, like tapered edges and then those get mounted to a plate that gets lifted off the vacuum form bed that then gets vacuum formed and then you got to take that part off and trim it out and clean it up and skin it and Mm -hmm. all these other things so using i guess three or four different digital fabrication machines, but you're hand working at every step yeah. of that way too, for just like a generic architecture model. I always wanted a vacuum former when I was in grade nine. Uh, we had one in the classroom and I, I raced remote control cars and I always wanted to make like my own remote control car body. Uh, like hand carve a piece of wood to use as a mold. Um, and I tried a couple times and uh, fucked up the machine. And uh, then, it, so the, the clear sheets had like a film on them. The colored sheets just came and you just boop, no problem. And the clear sheets, we just thought they were like transparent blue sheets. But in reality, they were clear sheets with a transparent blue film across them. 
and uh, you're supposed to take off the film before you vacuum form it. And we didn't, and we fucked up the machine, and uh, then I wasn't allowed to use it anymore. <laughs> and uh, so I never got to make my b- body, but I saw Chad and custom Chad's custom creations. He's got a vacuum former now, and maybe uh, if I get back into remote control cars when my kids get a little older, I'll, I'll buy one and, and do it in my house instead of at the high school so that, you know, it'll be fun. But, yeah, it, thinking about that now i could think i could cnc does like i could take there's there's 3d scans of just about every car out there and so i could take my car like d- download a 3d model of it you put it in a, a cnc carve it out and vacuum form my car and make an rc car of it that's pretty cool to think about yep i'm not that talented i don't think i'd be able to do it but i could it is a possibility. <laughs> yeah. You could do it. There's plans out there to build your own vacuum form machines, too. I think oh, some of them off of as simple as like a shop vac. Yeah, I've seen a couple of them, and uh, I don't know why I haven't done it. Probably because I don't race our cars anymore. It's time. Time is a, is a fickle beast. Like you were saying, it's all about like why you don't car hand. Would you think if you had unlimited time, you would hand carve the things you do? Uh, unlimited time. We're talking time doesn't matter. I still think it would be. I know it'll piss people off, but I still think it's kind of a waste. If I had the CNC machine too, it's a waste of time. Yep, <laughs> that's how I feel too. It's. I guess for me, and I guess woodwork. I've been woodworking for about twenty years now, and it's always about. The goal, some of the goals are like you get the tools that do the jobs for you. Like you want to make straight cuts, like your goal is to get a table saw. You want to make curve cuts, your goal is to get a bandsaw. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to be jigsawing anything if I have a bandsaw. <laughs> Sometimes I do, be- just because it's fun. It's fun to be cursing at a machine. <laughs> Every once in a while you're like, I want to remind myself why I prefer the bandsaw to this piece <laughs> of shit. <laughs> It was just the cut quality. That's like yeah. I'm saying. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. But you got to remind it. You got to remind yourself about how bad it is. That's what I got to do. Every once in a while, I got to go pull out the, the jigsaw and go, "Fuck, this machine sucks," and go back to the bandsaw. It's nice. It's nice to remind yourself. I think. No, I no one else jigsaw. agrees. <laughs> no, I put the jigsaw in a very like tough to get to place, so I don't ever make that mistake. <laughs> It's in the back of a tool cabinet. It's there if I need it, but yeah. if I can lift that piece up on the bandsaw, I'm going to cut it on the bandsaw. Uh, yeah, good. Now, if you could, so okay, you're, you're designing like earlier today. You posted some furniture that you'd made a while ago. I think it was a throwback post to uh, I want to say like zebra maple or something like that. Did you design that and cut it out on the CNC, or was that? hand uh like controlled on the bandsaw how did you cut that uh piece of furniture out it was a combination of everything so okay, okay. to start it's uh it's my version of a z chair the original one was designed by paul gasol for i guess in the mid-century mid-century so mid-century modern chair i made mine with thinner members and a much wider lower stance like a lounge chair instead of a occasional chair i don't know what the, the correct term for that is but so it would be my version of a, someone else's design of a chair, but right. I CNC the parts that were easier to CNC and then I hand cut everything else. So I basically made a template of the frame and I could flush trim all those pieces and then domino all those together to make the frames. But the cross, the cross members of all the chairs were four axis CNC machines. So I could cut all my tenons in at weird angles without having to set up a mortiser or a drill press or a flush trim router bit on that. And then I can cut the tenons on all the ends. So with my flush trim template, I also cut in the internal pockets too. So I can basically handmade the sides and then CNC made the middle. And then it all comes together. And that's how it is. That's how that one was for me. It could all be handmade. It could all be CNC machine made for me. And the way I decided to spend my time on it was about half and half. Interesting. Do you think you did it the most efficient way possible? Oh, no. Nothing I do is the most efficient way possible. 
I try, right. I try to do my best to be time efficient, but I would say no, even a three hour cut of a saw stop handle that gets sold for a hundred dollars. Like it's not an efficient use of my time, but I think it's funny to have them out there. Well, I get you're saying it's not the most efficient. Is it the most efficient way to make that piece? For me and the tools I have, yes. In the skill right. sets I have. I'm not going to hand so, carve them. So then it is the most. So then your chair, did you choose the pieces because it would be more efficient to use the CNC, the fourth axis CNC to do that than other uh, than other ones? It, for me, it kind of took out the pieces I decided to mill on the CNC machine um, were the where the tenons are going to go basically for the tenons in the pocket. So those are all precisely drawn on the computer and then cut by the way I programmed it. It's all very precise. Whereas if I was going to do that by hand, I would either have to CNC a jig to do it, or there would be a lot of measuring. And then I think with that comes into more, more inclined for human error. Right. So, so if you did it perfectly on the first try, it might've been faster to do it by hand, Yeah, but there's more likely a chance you wouldn't do it on the first try and you'd wreck a nice piece of wood. Yep. Gotcha. Exactly. Uh, and then also it's the pieces that are easier to make on the CNC run on the CNC, but while the CNC machine is running those parts, I'm flush trimming the frame out. So I'm doing multiple operations at the same time, which I guess is another big, big thing for CNC. Yeah. It's another set of hands basically. Especially if you trust your CNC. I'm not there yet. <laughs> I'm not in the trusting my CNC. It is bro. It is like I had a lot of like I've only been doing a little bit, and it's a CNC mill, like a metalworking CNC mill, and it's a homemade like conversion. So I'm not in the trusting phase because it has been erratic at best. It has dropped <laughs> at Z a multiple times and been very, very, very problematic. But I'm starting to get there. I've made every mistake you can make. I've lit damn near every CNC machine I've ever used on fire. Oh, wow. Gutting. Um, man, I had a good one. I was, it's a lazy thing, but on my big uh, Cam Master, C the four foot by eight foot CNC machine that I have, I needed to drill like two holes and I had a, a quarter inch end mill in and I drilled those two holes with that. And that's wrong because it gets really hot and it doesn't feed the chips out. Yep. And I have, that's on a vacuum table. So I did through holes. So there was a fire and I could smell it, but you couldn't see anything because the vacuum was sucking all of the smoke and flames down into oh, the chamber. No. And then like just pumping a, a clean kind of smoke out that you couldn't really see, but you could I'm like something's on fire, something's on fire, something's on fire. And <laughs> when I was at the University of Illinois, we they didn't have any money to buy router bits. So we were cutting with the router bits that were there, which were all dull. And <laughs> we cut through enough shitty plywood with dull router bits, you're going to light it on fire. I believe and that. I, on the Haas, I inlaid some aluminum into walnut and like epoxied it in and then went back to mill the aluminum to like a 3D shape down. And those little pieces of aluminum got so hot that it lit the walnut on fire. Wow. Oh, wow. Didn't, I didn't want to lube it at that point either because it would ruin the wood. Yeah. And I've, I've gouged every table I've ever used. I've gouged the cast iron top of the Haas a couple of times. I had some problems with collets on my cam master where the bits would just slip a half inch or half inch collet was bad. So the bits would just slip out and I'm like, I'm just not getting this thing tight enough. So I tighten it tighter and tighter each time and it never fixed anything. It's like yeah. throw all these away and buy all new collets. They're a dollar a piece. <laughs> and at U of I, I drove it right. I drove a foam cutting bit right into the phenolic aluminum top of like a big CR Onzer machine. Wow. My first week I was working at a gun shop doing rotary work on rifle stocks and they gave us all a $400 caliper to zero our tools. <laughs> I crushed that thing like day number two. Oh, <laughs> we'll pay for the first one and you got to buy, you got to buy the next one. So it's like, you make that mistake. I made that mistake once, but <laughs> it was a costly first mistake. <laughs> yeah. I believe that that's at least they're nice enough to pay for the first one. That's, that's a nice company. Most companies are like, ah, well, you buy everyone. <laughs> Well, that, yeah, that, that comes with a, that was a learning curve, a quick learning curve, but that was a learning curve on that. Is I'd spun the hand dial on the CNC to zero this tool. I spun it the wrong direction and it just crushed it. So there's yep. human error in CNC work all the time too. So, well, this is definitely so on, on my CNC mill, it has 
four like arrow keys and one is the x y and the other one it looks the exact same and it does the z and nothing the other two keys do nothing right and the amount of times that i'm trying to do an x or a y and for some reason i touch the wrong side and i do the z and i will fucking you know put the just i don't know just does something stupid right like it's it's really quick it's really quick on how quickly you can screw something up Oh, yeah. but you know who doesn't screw things up? Our Patreon supporters. So I want to thank our Patreon supporters, especially the F Clamp level supporters: Brent Jarvis from Clean Cut Woodworking, Vincent Ferrari from Digitally Creative, Scott from Dad It Yourself DIY, Joe Herdina, Lawrence from Maritime Knife Supply, Rich from Low End Designs, who is the one who gave me my CNC mill, and David Wood from DW Wood Builds. Uh, all of those people and everyone else who supports us gets access to the pre-show, after-show. And uh, keychains that are made by me, as well as we now have a Discord server where we're going to be hosting Patreon exclusive uh, chats. So you can come hang out with us and, uh, you know, on a monthly basis, hang out with everyone or someone, minimum me, because I've got no life apparently. Uh, and, uh, and we'll do an hour long chat or until I run out of beer. So it'll be a good time. If you want to find out about that go on to patreon.com slash clamp so my clamp mendation is going to be for Emmett at dead rise woodcrafts he's doing a a maker a treescape maker collab where he's asking everyone to make or asking anyone who wants to participate to make little trees to go on a, a piece that he'll raffle off for charity and then he's also asking for uh, other donations too that he can raffle off as well so i mm-hmm. sent him a mallet so if anyone out there wants one of my mounts, you can go bid on it through him when he's ready. Well, that was going to be my clamp mandation, so <laughs> I guess I get screwed for going first or for asking if you wanted to go first or not. Um, so now uh, I'm going to put myself as last while I go search for something else. And uh, Jesse, you're up. Uh, so for mine, I'm going to recommend the movie Nanny. Uh, it's a horror movie, of course. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime. It is a really excellent folk horror set in modern day. Um, I don't really want to tell you which folk creatures are in it because it will give things away, but it is an absolutely beautiful movie. The colors are super, like, amazingly vivid, and the music is haunting and beautiful, and I just, I really enjoyed it. It's a pretty short one, so yeah, if you want to be creeped out, yeah, go watch Nanny on Amazon. Cool. You in your horror movies. That's all I do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my clear for this week is going to be Scott Jab Woodshop, who Grant has met. Um, he makes yes. some really cool models. And I was looking through his Instagram the other day, and he has this like Harley Davidson that I thought was a model, and then saw a picture next to it of a kid sitting on it and realized it's a full size rocking chair or like rocking yes. horse. Let's wow. see. Yeah. yeah, his models are really cool. Well, I Always helped uh, Scott with that. I did the uh, logo on the side where it says uh, Ollie Scottson. So it says, oh, yeah. if you look on the side, instead of saying Harley mm-hmm. Davidson, it's Ollie Scottson. And I did that little bit of nothing work for him because it's just I, I downloaded a Harley Davidson font. Uh, but for some people, <laughs> if, they, if, they, if you don't know what to do, you don't know what to do. Right. Yeah. So it was really cool to be able to help him out with that. So that's a good one. Uh, to because I was going to say the the treescape uh, as my particular recommendation this week. Instead, I'll grab one of the the coolest trees I've seen so far. Uh, there's been a lot of great ones. Uh, so if you made one and and you're not the person I'm about to say, I you, you made a great one too. But I'm going to particularly shout out Jeff, a weird guy, and his uh, Lego tree. Uh, that he milled out of aluminum, which I thought was super cool. Um, and I know there's been a couple other really cool ones, but that's the one that I'm going to pick. Go check out Jeff uh, and and check out his tree. And, of course, check out Emmett. And if you can 
uh, make a tree for his treescape. I think it's going to be ridiculous looking. The amount of different <laughs> trees <laughs> uh, is going to be really cool to see when it's all done. And I hope, uh, you know, he raised a lot of money for that charity. So now we're going to go on to the Ask Us Anything. And we have a question. Another question from DW Woodbuilds is, would you make a musical instrument? And then if so, what? And if not, why not? And we'll, we'll pass over to Nick first, put him under the fire. I've dabbled with guitar bodies, but I don't. I don't even want to pretend like I know what goes into <laughs> making nice ones. <laughs> a lot of boobs. <laughs> it usually doesn't hurt. <laughs> a, guitar, so, a, a guitar cut off in boobs would actually probably sell pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> you should make one and, see, and give it to Steel Panther. They'd love that. <laughs> But yeah, if I had, if there was one instrument I don't want to make, it'd probably be a harp or something harp shaped. That seems crazy. Hmm. I feel like a harp would probably be one of the easy ones, mm-hmm. especially if you just like designed it out of a computer. Yeah, that one I, I don't know. That I, I guess that there I would want it. That seems like traditional in the way they bend the wood to do those. I don't think it would be a. For me, I don't think it would, if I was tasked with doing it, I think I would have to learn the bending and how to bend them. And yeah. How, what, what There's probably so much more that goes into that instrument than I'm thinking, like the tension mm-hmm. of the strings and everything. Yes. How like yeah. how long the strings are, how they're spaced. There's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Adam, what about you? Well, I actually have a long time dream to make it an entire band. I want to make like a guitar, a bass, a drum kit, microphone, everything from scratch, but all like matching. And I want to make it. um, So James Hetfield from Metallica, he has a guitar that was made out of the old garage they used to play in, like when they when they first started. So the garage got destroyed, and then all the two by fours. Um, someone took some of the two by fours and made a guitar out of them, and it looks really sick. And I really wanted like copy that sort of design and make like, yeah an entire band that matches. I think that'd be really cool, huh. but so much work. Yeah, Jesse, I'm gonna go into the deep end here because I've been watching a lot of violin making uh, reels <laughs> and TikToks, and. In a dream world where I had all the tools and time I needed, I would really like to attempt to make a violin. It is just such a like intricate and interesting process. And there are so many different body types that you can have and they all sound different. Yeah, I, I think that's fascinating. So if I could, I would. <laughs> I, I have no desire to make a musical instrument because I can't play anything. <laughs> and uh, basically like... I think they're cool. I, I'd i like to have a guitar I can hang on the wall so that when a musically inclined person comes over, they have something they can grab and play around the campfire. But I've tried. I, it doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't work in my head. I don't have any timing. Like, my timing is horrible. <laughs> I can't, like, I tr- like, if you ask my wife about singing songs, I, like, start a song and, like, by the third or fourth word I've started a different song so like I can't I can't <laughs> like I can't recite a song from memory uh so you can make I feel like a tambourine or something yeah like I could I definitely could could I make one yeah I could did you guys make I, triangles at high caliber camp so the triangles weren't musical instrument triangles they're dinner bell triangles because they weren't like tuned or anything oh okay yeah, it's just kind I of think it's, clang. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I want to thank TF Turning for the theme song. I want to thank uh, Nick for coming here. Uh, Nick, why don't you tell everyone, I know you said it at the top, but in case anyone right at the end is finally picking up their phone, ready to Google where you're at, tell everyone where they can find you. You can find me on Instagram at Birch Told Design Build. Yeah. And links to everything from there. All right. Thank you so much, Nick. It's been a f- real pleasure having you on. Um, yes. And now we're yes. going to head over into the after show where we're going to talk about some more secret stuff. See you all there. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>